Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Tyree from Norwich Alliance Church, and welcome to this week's message. I want to uh, begin, of course, with you in prayer. Uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for being a God who heals, a God who loves us, a God who has provided richly for us uh, in Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, as we pray that we can come to you with uh, all of our challenges. Uh, Father, currently in, in our area, we're having an uptick in COVID uh, positive cases uh, in our area. And we pray for all of those families and individuals who are affected by this. Uh, we, we find it very uh, scary, Father, to um, know friends and neighbors, even uh, some in our church family. We pray for Mary, uh, who found out this week that she is COVID positive. We ask you uh, to heal her, to be with those who care for her, and to also be with her family members who've also been tested. God, we thank you that you're our provider. Uh, people are still looking for work, and some, we thank you in answer to prayer, have found jobs, but we pray for those still looking. We also pray that our hearts would be open to the comfort, encouragement, and strength that we can be given as a gift of your grace uh, through your word today and through our communion with you, which we'll remember uh, today at the end of this message, a, a time of sharing with Christ around uh, remembering his blood shed for our sins to forgive and cleanse us and his body broken so that we could be whole. Father, grant that as we look to you today, uh, we will live in new ways, in new trust, and give us hope, Father, that comes from faith. We pray this in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. I uh, want to thank you for being a part of our uh, gathering today. Uh, we're going to talk about being yoked with Christ uh, later in the message. Uh, the theme, though, is complete commitment to Christ. You know, uh, look at these two oxen in this photo. Uh, they are committed to one another. Uh, th as long as they're in this yoke, they have to go the same direction. They have to pull uh, in the same direction, pull their part of the weight. If one pulls and the other doesn't, uh, that's not fair or right. Uh, Christ wants us to join him. He said in Matthew eleven twenty nine. Take my yoke upon you. My burden is easy. It's light because Christ is pulling uh, with us and for us. Let's uh, look into that today from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, uh, verses 14 and chapter 7, the uh, first verse. As we uh, look at this call uh, that Christ has on our life, an invitation really, uh, to come and be yoked together, as it says. Uh, that's a common image, by the way. If you go to Africa, you see a, a yokes of oxen. If you go to rural Australia, you'll see it. You can see yokes of oxen in the Middle East today if you travel to that part of the world. It, it's a common thing to see, and it was very common uh, in Jesus' time for people to be plowing fields or pulling heavy wagons with two oxen yoked together. Well, Christ is calling us to a total commitment. Let's look at the commitment we're called to. And we'll start at the end of the passage today and then work our way back. Um, in chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians, the first verse, which, by the way, goes with the things in chapter 6, Paul said, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Well, that's a lot to think about, and, and that's the uh, theme of, of this entire passage. So uh, this time I thought I'd let you read the end of the book before we look at all the whys and wherefores that bring us uh, to this, this final conclusion. The moment you believe in Jesus, the moment you put your faith and trust in him and transfer it from whatever you've been trusting uh, before you trusted Christ, he sanctifies you. The word means he sets your life apart for a holy purpose. Uh, Paul has said this many ways in First and Second Corinthians. He said, you've become a new creation. The old passed away and now you're a new person. Uh, the old is gone and, and everything is new. The 
moment you believe, God forgives you. As it says in the New Testament, he cleanses you from all sin. That, uh, he pardoned you. Uh, that doesn't mean you totally stop sinning, does it? Uh, it means that you're forgiven. Our behavior and our attitudes and our passions and ambitions, though, uh, need to change to catch up with God's forgiving, pardoning grace. Shall we go on sinning? Paul asked the Romans when he wrote to them that grace may increase. By no means. Uh, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? In a moment when we enjoy communion together, we'll talk about dying Christ's death with him on the cross so that we can live a new life. And remember that that's part of our identification, uh, our commitment to Christ. Well, some of our old sin habits and addictions uh, changed, and that's a wonderful thing. But some not so much, right? So Paul is saying, purify yourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. Uh, if I made an omelet for you, a three egg omelet, and I put two beautiful eggs in it, and you were watching me make your omelet, um, and you were anticipating that as I put everything you told me you love in an omelet. And then the, the third egg though was uh, kind of black and fuzzy and rotten. And you watch me kind of s sneak that into the skillet. Uh, would you go ahead and eat that omelet? Probably not. No, <laughs> I wouldn't eat it either. In fact, I wouldn't make such an omelet for you. But when God looks at our life, and that's what we're offering to him is our life uh, with lots of good things, perhaps, but um, some, some things that are dark and rotten as well. Uh, we want to offer God a, a pure life because we love him. Um, and so when he said to, to purify yourselves from everything that contaminates, he started with the body. And what are th uh, things that contaminate uh, the body? Well, those are outward sins. Uh, those are things uh, we do on, on the outside like stealing or hurting people with angry words or lying. Uh, Paul is saying uh, you should use your body to worship God in, in Romans 6 and again here. Can, and then he said to uh, take everything that contaminates your spirit. What are those? Well, those are internal sins. Things like unbelief, not trusting God. Uh, trusting your own way and your own opinions and your own ideas of right and wrong and distrusting his. Uh, being more committed to self or society than to Christ. The culture uh, right now is making us choose. Uh, people are, are no longer being uh, tolerant about anything, though they, they claim uh, a kind of tolerance. Uh, they actually only tolerate people who agree with them. Uh, that could actually do some good, I think. Uh, Christians are being forced at the moment uh, to choose Christ or choose the world, to choose uh, his morality or to choose the world's immorality. You, you have to choose uh, one side. You can't uh, get in a yoke uh, with uh, an ox that's going one direction and a, and a donkey that's going the other. It, it won't work. Jesus loves the people on both sides of every issue. Uh, the immoral world demands that you uh, say their words and, and wear uh, their emblems and uh, march to their drum. But you and I cannot have two hearts. Uh, we have to be committed to pleasing Christ or them. And we honestly cannot do both. Well, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. That's our assignment uh, from God and from Paul. Here's a question. Do you really want to be holy? Um, uh, New England here, we have a saying, uh, we, we say that something is wicked good, which is actually a self-contradictory uh, statement. But it does reflect our, our culture. Most people, even many Christians, uh, don't want to be too good. Um, A.W. Tozer, in, in one of his books, uh, said, we have all of the Holy Spirit uh, we really want. We have all of God's holiness we really want. Uh, our life is, is, if it's compromised in a mixture of wicked and good, is that way because that's what we've chosen. 
So do you have a goal to be more like Christ? We should. Paul is inviting us to a better, higher, holier life. Uh, accept his invitation. Uh, the Holy Spirit's power and leading is absolutely necessary. We cannot live this life on our own. But thanks to God, thanks to Christ who lives in us, uh, we can live this life. God's always more willing to help you than you are to seek his help. Let's go to the second point in the passage. Paul, uh, if we back up now uh, to chapter 6, verses 16 to 18, uh, the promises are for people who will commit themselves to Christ. If you're really committed, these promises are for you. If you're not really committed, you may be a Christian and you may end up in heaven, uh, but, th but these promises are not made to you. I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. You see, that's a these are propositional statements. If, if we do something, God does something. He said, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Uh, when they dedicated the temple to God in the Old Testament, you can read that in Leviticus uh, chapter 26. They blessed every part of it. They cleansed every part of it. They washed every part of it. And they said, this is for worshiping God. And that's all it's for. It's not for anything else. And you remember how disappointed Jesus was when they had turned it into a place to make money uh, in, in New Testament times. Uh, this was to be dedicated for the worship and glory of God. And now, Paul is using that illustration uh, to point to your life and my life, your body and mine, your mind and mine, and say, you now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Since he said this in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, he said, you, however, are in the realm of the Spirit. And in the realm of the Spirit is indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. Uh, we are the temple of the living God, he said in verse 16. So God has promised if you will unite with him in faith, if you'll trust him to forgive your sins and uh, submit your life to live for him, to get into this yoke with Christ that he's invited us into, uh, you have to walk in his direction, though. It's, it's a real actual commitment, and honestly, 21st century Westerners are almost completely a commitment adversive. We, we have a real trouble being actually committed to anything. We'll, we'll join as long as you have no uh, membership requirements. That's our idea. Well, Jesus said, love uh, the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He said this is, is the greatest commandment. But, but love is more than just a, a fuzzy feeling. It, it's a commitment to actually, said, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. You will walk with Christ and, and obey him and live for him and, and do the things he commands us to do and avoid doing the things he's commanded us not to do. If we do that, the promise is here for those who believe. Uh, faith in Christ brings a, a powerful unity with Christ, a communion that we're going to celebrate in, in just a few moments. But if you're not power for you, powerfully united with Christ, if you uh, decided you're not going to get into a yoke with him and go the same direction, uh, following his lead, uh, that's a weak relationship. He, he made another promise. He said, consecration, commitment, uh, it demands separation from uh, other things that, that Christ, you, you cannot be uh, yoked together with, with everything. Uh, in verse 17, he said, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. He's not talking about retreating into a Christian bubble like uh, Christians going into a fortress and pulling up the drawbridge and all of us only associating with other uh, Christians and people who are, uh, in our estimation, good and holy and 
Uh, he's not talking about going to live in a cave by yourself so you can't sin. <laughs> uh, what Christ is, is talking about uh, is you and I being different from the people around us, from the culture around us. Jesus uh, is not encouraging you to go hide somewhere from your mission. And your mission is to love people, uh, to love lost people. He, Jesus, you know, spent 80% of his time, if you read the four Gospels, with these 12 men who weren't yet believers. 80% of his time with the disciples, helping them learn to know him and, and believe and trust him. Uh, that might be an indication for how we're to spend our time. What about your life makes you distinctive from the fallen, godless, uh, pagan culture around you? Uh, that's a legitimate question. If we don't follow the path of legalism and uh, we don't just make rules to exclude people, but we uh, reach out to include them in, in our lives, in our families, uh, Jesus didn't get drunk uh, with his friends or high. Uh, he didn't agree with the immoral culture when they said something was fine and it isn't fine with God. Uh, he said it wasn't fine. When the world wanted him to hate or, or not agree uh, with goodness, uh, Christ refused. He said we're to be separate, we're to be different. Are, are you... Uh, terrified of the idea of being different because the world makes you pay a price if you're different, right? Uh, you get uh, teased, criticized, belittled. Uh, people decide not to be your friend. Well, why would you do this? Well, it's because there's a promise attached to it. He said, if you touch no unclean thing, I will receive you. We have this invitation. Uh, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty in verse 18. These promises are there uh, for people who identify with Christ. Uh, Jesus said in, in John's gospel, uh, if you believe and receive me, then I will give you the power to become the sons of God, the daughters of God. But we actually have to believe and put our trust in, in him. And you're saying, but I, I can sin and still go to heaven. Uh, that may be true, uh, but you will have a broken relationship and, and you'll not have great fellowship with God because uh, you can't have a powerful relationship with God and be headed in the opposite direction. Uh, we uh, find the power of God working with us when we get into Christ's easy yoke and, and go the direction he's going. Well, there's another uh, promise and another point here. Let's, uh, let's look at it. In this uh, next point, it says that the cleansing of your life has to progress from self to Christ. This is in verses 14 through 16. Do not be yoked together. There's that idea again with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? So Christ is inviting us to uh, make him, uh, to join in this yoke with him. That is a commitment to limitations. Uh, uh, we're willing to say, I'm going to forgo uh, things that I can't do while I'm yoked together with Jesus Christ. You can be a friend to sinners. Jesus was a friend to sinners. But we don't put that relationship in, in front of or before our relationship with Christ. And, and that it really includes very much the people uh, we date and marry, the people we go into business with, uh, the organizations we join and associate our name with. If you're gonna make a commitment to a cause or to a philosophy uh, or to a worldview, uh, you have to make that serve your relationship with Christ, which is your first allegiance. So Jesus is saying you can't have an allegiance with Christ and uh, allegiance with those who oppose and, and reject Christ at the same time. You can love them, uh, but you certainly can't agree with them. Uh, 
What is being yoked with Christ or yoked with unbelievers? Well, um, these oxen that were tied together uh, pulled hard and, and the yoke bound them together. Uh, it was placed on them, but voluntarily. Uh, they were trained to accept the yoke and you and I have to be trained to do that as well. Uh, we are naturally independent and, and want no limitations, as I said before, to go always in, in our own direction all the time. You can't love God and love things he hates. You can love people, but you can't agree with the, everything they believe and do. Not and be yoked with Christ. The choice is there. Uh, what do righteousness and wickedness have in common is, is the question we have to answer. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world and people loved darkness and hated the light, Jesus said in John 3, 19. You know, uh, Pastor Miles McPherson uh, preached a sermon called The Third Option. He said, the world is going to try to make you choose. They're going to try to make you choose uh, between uh, black and white, right and left, uh, gay and straight, police and protester. They're going to try to make you choose. McPherson said we have a third choice. Uh, the third choice is Christ. He loves people on the, on the left and right in, in all of these categories, and we should love them too. But we can't agree with all of them. We need to agree with Christ. Your heart, your mind and body belong to Christ. They're his dwelling place. Clean house today. As we take communion in just a moment, I want you to surrender your life in a fresh way. Consecrate yourself. Uh, as he said, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for Christ. That's your assignment today. Take anything that outward sin, inward sin, uh, allegiances you've made and, and made more important than your oneness with Christ, uh, take those things and put them aside as we remember Christ uh, in communion. I'll uh, put this, uh, this uh, slide on the screen and you can pause if you're watching the recording today and uh, read this passage together as a family. Uh, I receive the Lord what I passed on to you and then, and then eat the bread together and have someone pray. And then read the second part. The, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this, whatever you drink it in remembrance of me. Drink the cup and, and pray. And when you pray, ask God to completely uh, consecrate your life, to take every part of you and make it part of him as these uh, elements, these, this bread and this cup become part of you. Uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for cleansing us, for giving us your easy yoke. If we join you in this, you will pull with us. You'll, all these promises that are in this great passage will be true. You'll come and live in us and you'll walk with us. You'll preserve, protect, encourage us. Uh, you'll deliver us from evil, uh, even our own evil tendencies, our, our own ideas that entrap and enslave us and, and cause us to be a, a poor influence on people around us whom we love. Give us strength, Father, to agree with you and not to agree with the world. Love isn't agreeing with everyone. It's, it's loving them and telling them the truth in Christ. We pray, Father, as we are united with you, you will purify us, body, soul, and spirit, as we walk with you, uh, bound together by your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.